Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. The fire sector or emergency response sector is constantly striving to do more with less, but the scope of the job, the map kit on the trucks, the diversity of incidents that crews are expected to respond to is just continuing to grow. We need to be sharper and fitter and much more efficient in all the training that we deliver. And the problem with ops discretion is that if you are you know, a practical based person like myself, the statement that it's an unforeseeable event possibly is a feedback loop with no exit. If we spend long enough thinking about everything, everything's always foreseeable, therefore it's by default not post discretion. If we called our post discretion rationalised professional judgment, everybody would understand what it is. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative waterproof breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide Gore-Tex going further together Catherine welcome to the podcast how are you I'm good thank you thank you so much for joining me on this uh, on this morning I know we've tried for a couple of weeks we said just before we came on about you know, being relentlessly busy individuals and wanted to make sure we had this uh, booked into our diary. So we exchanged some quick emails last night and here we are, lo and behold, almost as the consummate professionals that knew what we were going to be doing this morning. <laughs> Always. <laughs> I wanted to um, start by framing our conversation to give us a sort of segue into what we're going to be discussing today um, mm-hmm. with a quote from your good self, which says that most organizations would like to believe they support and empower their leaders to make efficient and effective decisions, use discretion, apply a risk-based approach, and provide the organization with both competency-based assurance and operational accountability. But how do we ensure that these frontline leaders and the teams they work within can operate safely, effectively when faced with less frequent, which is a point I'd love to speak to you about, but potentially more complex situations and cases when realistic experience or training is harder to come by? And that kind of comes into this whole framing about you know, how incidents have changed over the past few years, the the less frequent we're experiencing them. So ultimately, I wanted to kick us off by saying, how do we train these individuals to deal with the unexpected? How do we make assertive, effective and safe? And how do you know you have an effective commander? So give us that whistle stop tour of how you find yourselves in the emergency services and kind of the journey up to standing here today and having a conversation with me. Okay, gosh, that's quite a, an opening. Uh, not really this, much, isn't it? <laughs> there. Um, yeah, so the, the, the sector as a whole um, needs to train its individuals to be able to cope with every situation that they face. But the constraints around that training um, and that assurance are often financial mm. and, and skill-based. Um, and as a consequence, the sector has been on um, a journey it, through my um, experiences since I joined the fire service in 2004 um, and it's continuing on that journey there's been definitely been some bumps in the road um, mm-hmm. which have as always influenced the direction of travel that anybody takes um, but I am optimistic that we're moving in a, um, a progressive direction that is paying appropriate um credence to things like data and systems and simulation tools to provide a holistic Mm. uh, opportunity for people to pick up those skills that they need. It is a historically difficult thing to try and deliver training like that because uh, for total transparency, you run a dedicated instant command uh, training company and you provide accredited qualifications for over 50 fire and rescue services, I think now. Okay. But we joined around, well, you actually joined four years earlier than me. I joined uh, the fire service in 2008. And since then, we have seen a, a real hemorrhaging, which is actually a positive thing. I think there's been, uh, I was reading, I think, in one of your articles between 
2018 has been a 20% reduction in total fire calls. However, in 2019, apparently there was a small annual rise in fires attended. And I'm not sure if that was uh, some of the heat waves and some of the other incidents, but obviously over the past five years, we have had some really significant incidents. While they may be few and far between, you know, we still hear the echoes of the Grenfells and the other really large incidents that, that some of the UK Fire and Rescue Services attended. And layering that upon, as we spoke before we came on, the hemorrhaging of skill sets, the changing of the guard, the colossal amount of retirement that we're seeing across the UK Fire and Rescue Service. It's why I see the work that effective commanders are so crucial now, because that kind of mentoring, training, uh, learning journey uh, for people on stations across the world, but certainly in the UK Fire and Rescue Service, that is becoming not only a sharper learning curve, but also with almost less help and resources and people to be able to facilitate that. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the, the fire sector, the emergency response sector, is constantly striving to do more with less yes. all the time. Less, the less, tagline. <laughs> less money, um, less time. But mm. the scope of the job, the map kit on the trucks, the um, diversity of incidents that um, crews are expected to respond to is just continuing to grow. Mm. As, as a consequence, we need to be sharper and fitter and much more efficient in all the training that we deliver. Mm. And that's coupled with the juxtaposition of um, on-call retained crews having a much higher churn rate or retention rate of personnel than they did 10, 15 years ago. Mm. And the sheer number of crews that are crew members that are needed to maintain the availability of that appliance. Mm. So that it's getting more and more diluted every step we go forward. Um, and it just makes the the challenge of credibility and quality of all that training um, needing to be maintained. It's It's a real challenge. Mm. One, I think, one thing I think that is um, partially going in our favour, because you spoke before um, the aspect of direct entry, which I know is something you're supporting with, consulting on, and trying to bring, um, as, as a subject matter expert, bring that extra bit of help or resource into that sector as well. But you and yourself, despite the fact you joined long, far long ago before you know, direct entry, kind of articulate that great eclectic background of skill sets because when we were talking before we organized the podcast together you gave me a bit of a, a whistle stop tour of your background around that farmer's daughter but with a passion as a research scientist could you just take me through kind of the time before you joined the fire and rescue service or the emergency service sector for want of a better description and how you found it versus what you expected it to be and then kind of as it evolved through your career, your perception of what it was that led you to the decision to not step away, but to, to go so passionately into what you do now. Um, okay, so starting right at the beginning, um, I am the eldest of four children and we, we live, on, live on a farm. Um, I'm very much a practical, um, pragmatic approach to solving most problems and a length of bale of twine can usually repair most things. Um, <laughs> and as a consequence, quite hands-on, practical um, kind of person that, you know, would be found, you know, you know mucking out horses, um, Christmas Day, we, Christmas didn't start till the cows had been sorted, you know, all of that uh, appropriate. I agree. Balance. I've tried to artificially create that for my daughter because we have three dogs and three horses, but we live away from them. We've got a few acres about 15 minutes away from us. But you're so right. That kind of can-do attitude, character-building aspect – of what a person develops like in that environment, I think serves them so well for life. Yeah, I, I, it's that appropriate balance. Um, so that was uh, my upbringing. Um, I then went to university to become a research scientist. Um, and um, I've got a, a degree, a master's and a PhD, all, all in the sciences. Um, Why did you like, want to be a research scientist? Sorry. Um, I like solving problems. Mm -hmm. um I, I like to make things better um and and that's that's always, always been my mantra and even as a, a small child my my nan would would say i used to quote if i if i can change something i will and if i can't i won't um and, and that's really quite a mantra by which i i clearly had it as a small child but i still kind of um work around now that if I can make something better 
Um, I, I will do. And as a small child, I, I had um, two aspirations. Um, one was to cure arthritis, and the second one was to disprove religion, which was a bit deep for somebody. Oh, I know. Disprove um, religion. I love religion. I'm not religious yeah, at all. I love I love it. It. Anyway, I'm quite cool with religion now, but it's funny that something I was, <laughs> I was quite keen on as a child of disproving it. Maybe it was Sunday school. But maybe that's where it resonated from. Don't you? I love how we can make a connection between the two, though, because I always say about religion, it's similar to opinions or beliefs, even in the fire and rescue service. Sometimes I'm like, if you can't specifically articulate a piece of information or data that would disprove what you believe, then you don't actually have a belief. You have like a religious ideology. And you see that with certain thoughts and beliefs in the fire and rescue service of procedures and the way it's always done. I'm like, but what piece of information would disprove that to you? If I say nothing, I'm like, well, there's not a logical thought process that's taking you to that belief then with all due respect to, to the religious aspect in that yeah no completely and, and i think the um passion about science and data and um having an answer and explanation as to why things have been done in that particular way mm. kind of connected those two thoughts even at a very early age mm. um and so that, that's how i went into sciences um and as up to my second postdoctoral research position, I became very disillusioned by what it was I was endeavouring to achieve. Um, research scientists, science is funded predominantly by grants that principal researchers apply for to get mm. a bunk, bucket of money to do a particular hypothesis. Mm. Uh, and regardless of whether that hypothesis gets disproved very quickly in that chunk of funding, you have to continue roughly on that direction of travel, even though you might just generate more and more data to to confirm you've disproved oh, okay. if that makes any mm. sense. No, and yeah. I was stuck in a couple of um pretty poor projects and um, became very disillusioned. And I had they a, can be long as well, can't they? You know, you're oh, talking yeah. about multiple it's years to, years, to yeah, gather yeah. data. Um and I had some friends who were in the fire service who were um well, working less hours than I was on permanent contracts because some research sciences is all, is all short term contracts. Um they're having far more fun than I was. And I just thought, hey, what, what are you doing? Um, so I started to explore and I applied to join the fire service, uh, recruited at the height of the women and ethnic minorities targets. Um, and as a consequence, I probably experienced some of the misguided, intentional... Um, positive action. Positive action right from the get-go, if I'm yeah. truly honest. Um, I started my career in um, West Midlands Fire Service and on a recruit class of like 24 of us, um, there were two women, one ethnic minority and the rest were white males. The three of us had been in the system less than six months, whereas the rest had been in the in the pool for over two and a half years. Um, so right from the very, very beginning, the well-intentioned support was off, off, offset, if you like, or askew to everything else. And we were our cards were probably marked right from the beginning. Um, and as a um, firefighter, as, sorry, as a scientist coming into the fire sector, I perceived that my array of skills and knowledge and diversity that I was bringing to the table would be welcomed, promoted, supported, and moved forward. Mm. Um, I've got a master's degree in radiation biology. Um, wow. And I was, I found out late in my career that I'd never be a hazmat officer at that moment in time where it was appropriate for me to become one because I was a woman and the policies, um, going back to this is where it always is, policies forbade me to go over the inner cordon, into the inner cordon because I was a woman. No, oh yeah, the radiation thing, because they have that with um, military females on flights as well don't they they're not allowed to go on certain yeah, flights for longer because they're not supposed to be exposed yeah. to certain radiations because the yeah. assumption is they should bear children at some point in time that is their uh social responsibility for for whatever yeah. description I appreciate all the science and all, all of that really significant um hiroshima type size radiation sagas but when we're dealing with a very small vial of um beta radiation in, in an epidorf in a lead covered tube in a in a locked fridge in a locked laboratory i, I really think i'm probably going to be okay do you know who sean green is yeah 
Oh, Sean Green uh, runs a lot of the hazmat officer training across the UK. And he is so comically brilliant in his presentation style and teaching style. And he he gives a great analogy, and I will ruin this, but I know you may be able to clunk through the fumble that I talk about. He says, radiation is a bit like sunlight sometimes. He says, you don't go outside and get all covered in sun, and then you bring sun inside and cover somebody else in sunshine. He says, try and think of certain aspects of radius, and that's a very poor, fumbled way of describing it. But he has a wonderful way, and I'm sure you do it far better than me, of talking about those misbeliefs and and, and myths that we believe around the black magic of, of hazmat. It, it, it's complete, and, and I'm, I often use the Homer Simpson analogy, that just because you see a traffic on the door does not mean that the nuclear power plant is going to blow up and your testicles are going to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> but of course it is, Catherine. I knew a guy once whose testicles <laughs> did exactly that. <laughs> you just need to take a bit more, uh, understand the risk and take appropriate care. It's really quite funny. Um, yeah. so, so when I joined the fire service, I said I was misguided. Um, so I really enjoyed my, um, my, my, my training in, in, in West Midlands. Um, I was definitely the annoying uh, three, four-year-old who constantly asks why. Why are we doing like this? Why, mm. why, 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 why? But um, that echoes back to your research scientist thing. Like asking better questions, you get better answers. And um, I know I'm treading all over it, but I'm, I'm, that plays must be a, play a big role in training incident completely. commanders now. Um, the, when I when I, when I started my recruits course, my I said my card was marked from the from the get go. People assumed I was a spy. Why was somebody with a PhD joining the fire service? And they had also assumed I would be the silver axe winner from day one of the course because I'm clearly intelligent and. Therefore, you, you'll pass your ace all the tests. Yeah. And in reality, I found the fire service tests incredibly difficult to answer because the questions never gave any context. And all mm. of the questions and all of the competency tests were all purely about regurgitation of information, mm. never with any context. And I'd look at the questions and go, well, it depends. I can't answer this because it depends. And I was always looking far too deep into the question that had been asked. And then not getting all the marks or the questions. And, and again, that's something that has resonated through my journey with, with the fire sector because the, the fire sector likes to, or at least it did, likes to produce robots and clones mm. who perform things in a consistent fashion mm. who don't have to think to solve problems. And then that takes me... Sort of to what I'm doing now, where you give them some stripes on the shoulder and, and you ask them to keep people safe, but you've not empowered me or taught me how to make decisions. You've just dis- been disempowering me for mm. the rest of my career, and now you yes. suddenly want me to switch it on. Um, yeah, you, we almost the road um... that was ever crossing, and now you want me to walk across the road. Any, but how did I do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we allow that muscle to atrophy, don't we? And yeah, then, and it. then, ironically, get frustrated people's lack of assertiveness or personal accountability or inability to make decisions even from managing their teams and leading their teams right up into the very crucial aspects of decision making on the incident ground and we don't inherently sometimes realize that we have caused that muscle to atrophy um yep. probably accidentally yeah and it's the um production of cocus amounts of policies and procedures which is where the sector definitely was 10 years ago there, there were that many um, you just need to open the yellow pages. That analogy still works now. Um, and, and find the right answer to your question because it would be in there. Whereas mm. it's much better to have fewer policies and much more equipped, skilled people to be able to resolve all issues, whether that's incident based or station based, mm. given the skills to do that. Because I'm sure you've experienced bad management of station based issues. 100%. Um, as, a, as a consequence, of people rigidly sticking to procedure as opposed to some pragmatic application of common sense that would be a much more... Always used to be one of the biggest frustrations of my station manager when he'd ask me about certain policies. And I'd say, I really don't know. And he says, well, you're a watch commander. You should know. And I'd say, look, with the greatest respect, the kind of guidance. He says, they're not guidance. I says, well, just go with me. (laughs) If I have to have to have a policy between me and another person in a table, our relationship has failed really badly. I said, I should, I don't want to know what's in it because I don't ever want to have to rely on it. And that doesn't mean I'm winging it. It means my, my moral compass, which is why you believe I should still be part of your service or brigade, 
should be able to guide me and I should have a clear understanding of our morals, values, ethics, and what we're about that I think it's okay. And I don't think it's a, it's a show of unprofessionalism in my capacity that I don't know that policy because no one's know. Yeah. Because I don't want that to be, because that's a stick. I'm just going to hit people with a stick and I'd much prefer not to use that. But this is also where I see when people struggle a lot with when national operational guidance and stuff first started coming in because we trained people to a specific procedural approach to things. And people were like, well, that's a bit woolly. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And I'll be hung, drawn and quartered if I just enact my own version of this guidance that you keep referring to. And that's been a very difficult journey for a lot of people, I think. Oh, really bad. Because we gave them the crutch and the framework that was the policies and procedures. And then we have slowly put them through the shredder and not mm-hmm. necessarily replaced it with training no. to um, support that decision making processes and often also those that decision making situation has also been audited by people who were maybe more ingrained in the rigid policy procedure architecture and then coming in and critiquing your performance or management of the situation using go back to using the crutches that are no longer available but yet you're now being measured by them mm. it's the old um uh meme of the person with the clipboard going i don't know how to do your job but my clipboard says you're doing it wrong so talk to me about the evolution through your career and then decision okay. uh to, to so, create effective command so i started um in west midlands um when i was stationed um to blue watch central um back in 2004 and if you've ever been to Birmingham, Blue Watch Central is a sorry, Central Station was the flagship station for West Midlands yes. Castle. It's the Beautiful. big one right in the centre of Birmingham. And um, it, it was uh, painted the, the sort of historical picture of a fire service with yes. lots and lots and lots of bay doors. I think it had 15 bay doors, cobbled streets. You know, it was the the, the greatest station to be. And um, I was uh, um, stationed to a watch with. Um, a black guy, and we were the poster watch for the service. We were on every yeah. social media post trying to get you to ride every fire engine for the picture. Because we painted the beautiful image of... <sighs> they never quite got that, did they? And some people are getting closer, but they said, we want diversity. What they actually meant was, we want people that look different but think exactly the same as we do. And I'm like, that that's not, mean? that's no, you missed it. You got so close and then took a sharp left hand turn before you arrived at where we were aiming for. Yeah. Um, but the, the watch were great. I had a, a spectacular time. Um, I had some um, individuals on my initial watch who were resentful at a woman being posted to their watch. Really? I think I, I think I became number 30 in West Mid. So it was, it was very early. Lots of them hadn't, hadn't seen women before the station <laughs> <laughs> and we um it's almost when you when you realize you're counting them that's probably a bad sign yeah i think i was about number 30 but when we were still mixed dorms and and that kind of it was all fine the guys were great they put me through my paces yeah. um and once i had proven that i could drag the heaviest of them out of the, the basement up the stairs and yes my techniques might be a bit different to theirs based on muscle physiology but I, I i i was accepted into the fold um had had a, had a great experience uh was informed that um my pay would increase from when i was slightly more than nothing really qualified pay by completion of this workbook I was, how long does workbook take to complete well most people take three years um so i i took six months to get the workbook finished um because it was like the biggest amount of pay increase i'd ever get in my life for completing yes. a very small amount of administration i think so it's I nine thousand pounds now since the pay rises yes yeah. so yeah. I, I pulled my finger out really got it done um and then oh now a qualified firefighter so now what do i do um i think i've been in 18 months and already people were asking me about getting to get promoted to crew manager and just like no it, it's a no it's a no for me i want to want to learn the trade cut my teeth um, so for that point, but I, I was always living in Manchester whilst I was working in West Mids. Um, I did the awful thing of transferring home, um, then worked in um, Manchester for a good couple of years. Um, 
during that point, uh, my partner and I adopted um, some children um, of school age. And that's a long process. A long process. That's, that's a long process. But I, I mentioned that because it was a key point on my sort of career journey for loads and loads of reasons. Um, anybody who has um, had to go through the process to, to adopt children will realize quite how intrusive that is on your mm-hmm. personal life to justify that you have the right skills and strengths to support these damaged individuals um, with their life. Um, but you also become, when you've had the children placed with you, you have to become a very astute communicator and very, very intuitive at reading situations to um, manage manage situations you, could, you, you wouldn't ever possibly anticipate they're going to go so left field, so fast, yeah, yeah. that you have to have this sixth sense. Um, and the, the communication skills to manage uh, in our case we had had four but not all at once but very different individuals with very different needs and um, academic abilities and emotional damage and trauma and all, you you have you, you become a very able communicator as a consequence of that mm. but I mentioned that for that reason um so when I was, I was in Manchester um we adopted the children Manchester then brought in their um, five watch system which was really particularly bad and the most unfamily friendly system they had they could ever have conceived where you could you start I don't know if you're aware of the the, the watch pattern yeah yeah I am so yeah you'd start the year having 300 and plus hours and they could call you in to fill that that void when you're on your short notice shift so an hour and a half notice trying to get night shift cover for three small people um was impossible it just could could not do it so at that point I then transferred back down south you can't um, comprehend the echo chamber of meeting that must have been when that was put together. It, <laughs> there must have been um, such low diversity in terms of phenomenal. family situations shocking. and life circumstances, which led to the uh, to the agreement to implement something like that. Shocking! It was just shocking. Um, but then took back to talk about numbers and diversity. I think when I transferred to Manchester, I became number sixteen. Congratulations! So, yes. Um, so yeah, so uh, I think they're that... in your headquarters and they go, "Wait there, HMI, roll out the diversity. Can you go and get number sixteen, please?" You just think, for yeah, God's sake, it was um, it was like that really. So, uh, but I think that possibly influenced the the lack of appropriateness of that five watt system when they brought it in. Um, mm. But anyway, so that that then brought me back down south. Um, came back to near family. Um, Great family support with the kids, all of that jazz. Um, then moved across into Oxfordshire Fire Service, um, spent some time on station, um, went from a, I was posted at um, Bolton Central when I was in Manchester, where we we're doing 15 shouts on the night shift, and then went down to Oxford, where we sometimes go a whole tour without turning a wheel. So the contrast was quite phenomenal. Mm. That wasn't the only contrast. Um, when you are on a busy station, busy watch, the training is grabbed in small segments to maximise application of skills with kit. Mm. Oxford, loads, loads more focus on theoretical knowledge and content around the equipment because there was the time. Um, And it was an observation that I have reflected on since I've left the sector. Um, and I think it, the other comparison would, is also down to the demographics of the organisation. Manchester's predominantly old time. I think they may have one retained mm. station. One, it's, it's very, very few, whereas Oxfordshire is majority retained mm. stations. So the training principles back then were quite different, much more about consistency and similarities and consistent okay. PowerPoints and <clears throat> less so about the individuality that trainers might bring to the table with being able to flex their own skill set to manage sessions mm. and the strengths of the team as opposed to the conformity that wanted to be evidenced. Um, one story I always tell is about um, the whole Matro kit. So I'd say Manchester were very much focused on the use of the, the kit, worrying about set considerations with kinks and hose, 
techniques, holding the tools, like cutting the roof off, etc. Yeah, I remember being um get put on an orientation around the truck doing locker drills with somebody who'd been assigned as my mentor, a really smart, clever, switched on chap. Um, and he's going around the kit and he pulled out the whole matcha pump and put it on the table and he said to me, Kath, what can you tell me about this? So I started telling him about the practical use of it, where the fuel goes, the oil, you know, the practical stuff. And he went, ah, Yeah, coat it. That's the rubbish. Function, construction, operation. This is what we do with it. That's how it's made up. His level of knowledge about this pump went down to the thickness of the paint on the box frame around the you, pump. You lose me there. I, yeah. I think that's that's the an unnecessary Phenomenal amount of information that he had retained. Yeah. That I would never, ever be able to emulate because that's not my way my brain works. Mm. Um, but he clearly been assessed on his ability to remember and regurgitate that information because he wouldn't have attempted to put it in the first place. Mm. Um, which, again, is it was another poignant step on reflection of, of my journey because I don't feel that's the most appropriate way to train people to practically use equipment or mm. manage situations, but it's very easy to mark. Unless so you're going to be part important. of a tender process or work in an appliance sector or, like I say, submit a national tender or you're going to make a change to legislation or safety requirements, I think that level of information and detail, because the irony I always say to people is, you drive the fire engine. And they say, yeah, yeah, I'm a driver on watch. Wonderful. Tell me how an internal combustion engine works. And they go, what? Tell, you just said you're a driver. Tell me how the internal combustion engine works. Well, I don't need to know. I just push the pedal and drive the vehicle. Right. Okay, sorry. So why do I care about the thickness of the paint on the whole matro pump? It's really quite curious how it got to that point. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I completely echo that sentiment. But like, my time in Oxford was was great. Um, I went whole time retained. Moving from the north to the south was a really expensive mm. route. Don't do that. You, you can get a lot less for your money when you move to Oxford from Manchester. I'll bet. Um, so I'm retained in order to be able to pay the bills. But I then also got to experience the fabulous resource that is the retained on-call mm. fire service and the great <clears throat> breadth of skills that these individuals bring mm. to the table. Um, back then, I don't think we necessarily embraced or utilised that skill level that to, to its maximum. Mm. Um, it's very much um, a two-tier system, I think, across the UK Fire and Rescue Service, because I think the on-call and RDS are often the actual best articulation of diversity, because these are subject matter experts in their own capacity. Some of them run multi-million pound companies. Some of them are doctoral researchers. Some of them have done 20 years career um, as a mechanic, as a farmer, as whatever it might be. And when you see them, you know, coming back to that aspect of how much does the trainer have put into the thing of themselves – they, you know, a lot of great leadership in the on-call sector put their managers in charge of, or put, sorry, members of their crew, firefighters in charge of drills because they're subject matter experts and they bring such a lovely, eclectic, quirky, different perspective to incidents. Yeah, completely. And we're very fortunate to work with lots of different pharmacists in the country and the problem-solving skills of the crews from Northumberland mm compared to a large metropolitan fire service are really quite different purely due to that exposure different management style i guess that's to yeah definitely the, the employment demographics so uh, moved, moved to oxfordshire uh spent some time on station um got promoted put my name in the hat for the watch manager pool um spent some time as a retained station support officer so got to work more with the retained and support their development and then um I then got moved for my development into training. You were given an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yes, given opportunities. <laughs> my skill set. So um, I was like, oh, good God, I really don't want to go into training. I don't want to go to instant command. Oh, and I, <laughs> it's just, this is really a bad call. And I, I, I kind of said, just come and, come and see, come and see. Um, um, well, cycle me back for a second then. So what was your first interaction when you first stepped into the temporary crew commander, um, crew crew, uh, <laughs> crew leader role? I'll dial, dial way back. Okay, so I put my name in the hat to become a crew manager. And at that point, I reckon that was probably around 2008, 2009, I, I received an appointment to attend a command assessment. Um, and I remember... Um, 
thinking someone's going to give me some development soon. I'm going to yeah. get some development before I go for this assessment. I keep standing here. It's going to come any second. And it's going to come. Um, <laughs> and I, the day before my assessment, my watch manager called me into the office. I thought, hallelujah. Here it is. Like, here comes my input. <laughs> and um, this is a story and a joke, by the way, I can tell all around the world. And because um, this is this is the frightening level of this. So in Oxford at this point in time, we had vector software, mm-hmm. simulation-based software, which I think, again, is, was found all around the world around that time. Mm-hmm. My watchman pulled me into the office and said, right, Kath, tomorrow you're going to have a command assessment. What you're going to get is that'd be a house fire in an end terrace property. The fire is going to um, come out of the, the sockets and faces around the back. So you must send a crew around the back, otherwise the fire will run along the sockets or along the road of the terraced houses. You need to make pumps for, um, and don't forget your AOA. And I looked at him and said, is that it? And he went, yeah, yeah, just remember that, you'll be fine. And I went for my assessment, and he was right. That was exactly the scenario that I got. Um, and I remembered my lines, and I passed the test. And I remember leaving the assessment thinking, holy crap, I'm now going to sit in the front of a fire mm. engine. Okay, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then, uh, <laughs> then my very, very first um, shift um, started on night shifts. And in Oxford, we have four high-rise buildings. Okay, oh, um, just four. And they're not massive ones based on many of the large <laughs> risks, but they're just four. Um, mm-hmm. But that's fine. And the mobilised system we had in Oxford, it listed all the trucks that were being turned out to the job. So I remember being sat in the lecture room delivering a lecture, prepared, mm-hmm. I was organised, training my crews, doing the right thing, and then the bells went down. And then we realised the high rises, and our truck was called first, because we were it was on our patch. And the list, and I could feel myself going, going grey. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I went and sat on the truck. Um, the truck somehow got itself to the job without any influence from me whatsoever. Um, all I was worried about as driving to this job is, are, are we going to be there first? If we're there first, what kit have we got to remember to get off the truck, depending whether we're first, second or third? Which segment of this process are we, depending on when we turn up? Mm-hmm. And we pulled up. I remember looking at this high-rise building, um, thinking, I need to do my 360. I was running around. Um, on this that night shift, we had a detached guy sat in um, – the number five spot who'd yep. been on our station for 27 years yeah. he just got off the truck when we pulled up at the building and he walked into the building had a look in the weed the biffer bin the bottom of the bin chute confirmed it was on fire dragged the hose wheel off dragged the bin out sorry dragged the hose wheel off open-ended it into the bin and then came and told me to put the fire out i was still in full headless chicken mode at the front of the building <laughs> Trying to work out what the hell it was that I was supposed to do first. What's the evacuation plan? Where's where, where, where do I put the bridgehead? What's the wh- do all, I do I do I secure water? That. Do I go aloft? What where, where am I doing? <laughs> I was stuck in complete and utter decision inertia because I that a major incident. <laughs> what it was I was supposed to do first, and and that I feel is just so wrong. Yes, so so wrong. Another sector, definitely back then. The focus was on assessment mm. only, only. I'll teach only. you how to pass the test, but I won't show you how to think. We had some really great guys in the incident command suite in Oxford at the point I was assessed who are trailblazers and are still trailblazers for incident command training. And mm. they openly admitted that there were so many failings of what they're trying to do, but what, what they had achieved was way better than what we'd previously had. Mm. And whilst the vector software was very, had huge limitations. It was again distinctly better than what we'd had. So it is the whole that evolutionary journey. But I definitely felt very ill equipped mm. when I dealt with that incident. And I've back to that, tried from that point forward to improve my knowledge. How though? Because I mean, for me, I just did it by um, sitting and doing tactical decision making exercises, watching YouTube videos, and yes. then saying, what if, and what if, and what if. And then trying to do that with one or two other firefighters at the time who were yeah, going through a similar process. Yeah, it was down to you as an individual. To- and we didn't get paid for it. 
because again with the greatest respect a lot of training development departments in that period of time despite their own desires were predominantly assessment centers they weren't training centers they wanted to be but they weren't given the resource or the freedom in a lot of instances no and it wasn't through lack of passion to make them no. better mm. the, what the drivers were at the time but um, it didn't discourage you you didn't throw your ticket in so you obviously no, I, didn't. I kind of stuck it out so take me forward to when you were given the opportunity to go into the incident command um, yes. sector. So i came into the incident command um department and um started doing some stuff with them and we started we were using the xvr software by then, and, um, it's, it's a good piece of kit, super flexible. Um, we deliver really good scenarios, and I, and I learned the skills to deliver, deliver and design assessments. We had a, an assessment uh, tool recording system in place that had been developed in house um, in Oxford, and the um, the system would generate data, okay. some some data, not nearly as much as the Vector Command does, but it generate data. There's twenty <clears throat> questions that we would assess against all directly aligned to the NOS. Um, and these numbers were put into an Excel sheet. And I asked, why? Because we put them in an Excel sheet. O okay. And uh, nobody ever looked at these data, all these numbers. And I, then the academic in me was reinvigorated looking at this, this information. Uh, I said, we really ought to do something with this. You've gotcha. it's a There's all kinds of trends process. we can pull from that assessment process um, that was being openly shared within um, the fire sector at the time, um, people did not know where it come from or why it looked like it did. So I was given permission um, to write a paper. So I think that was back in 2014, we wrote um, a paper on the assessment tool and the initial data trends that we had back in Oxford. Um, and we called it the introspect model. Um, and the paper was um, published in an academic journal, and then it was started to be read around the world as a consequence of um, its publication. Even uh, that language, sorry to interrupt, must have been foreign to a lot of the people you were working with, because if you said I'm going to write, I'm going to write a paper on this, they probably um, thought what well, and like put it in the it's service it's local like <laughs> messenger thing, or put it on the weekly update or something like that. And you said, no, I'm going to publish paper. it in an academic paper. So what does that mean? No one's going to read it. Um, we attended an XVR user group. So XVR is a simulation software that annually holds a, a UK user group. Mm. And it's hosted by a different fire service each year. And uh, the trigger year, it was hosted by North Hans. And North Hans, as part of the um, user group, are given some time to get a tour around their suite and explain how they are using the XVR software to, to yeah. deliver their assessments. And they they gave us a bit of a spiel and then they've talked about their assessment process. They put up the marking sheet that on the wall. And I looked at my colleagues and went, that's that's our marking sheet. And all they'd done in true Pfizer's fashion was delete the Oxfordshire logo off and put No, no, we don't do that. And um, um it <laughs> enough personnel changes had occurred in the department for them not to know where it come from, who'd given it to them. Yeah. Or even what it even looked like it did and what it was trying to achieve with the academic rigour and study that had gone behind conceiving it, if you like. And um, it, it, it pissed me off, if I'm honest. Mm. Um, <laughs> to, to, to write the paper. Um, but because I put an argument forward to the, the deputy for the time that we weren't getting the credit for what had been created in-house. Yeah. Had been created before I got there. But um, I then become part of its its journey, um, and it should be documented somewhere. And if we didn't give it a name or or give it a referenceable link, then the degradation of it would continue. Mm. That was my argument, and, and he agreed. Um, hence, and also the argument for the potential for whatever data had or had not been captured from that could have been contributing to the larger pool of. Of, of information that would support greater development and change but you don't know that because you're just arbitrarily using a thing that you've stolen and bastardized and don't really understand the context of correct yeah <laughs> so that's kind of where my exit from the fire service started um so I published this paper um it was being read around the world and i was receiving um communications from other fire services around the world who were asking me questions about um 
assessment strategies and use of simulation. Uh, the what is the appetite like internally for this? Sorry, because sometimes that can itself go two ways. Where uh, some people so are proud and, and appreciate what you do, it, they were super proud Good. initially. Um, they didn't tell you to get back in your box, and then there were some management changes. And um, so I've always been very different. Um, that I bring a lot of different things to the table that yeah. sometimes managers don't know how to control because I'm um, so different. So they either took the approach of empowering me to make them look good without fully knowing what the outcome was going to be, but mm. believing that it would be better than what we got. Or they would try to force the octopus back in the box and put a really big brick on the top. I've had that a few times. And uh, one of the best things I've had said to me was the re- one of the reasons I didn't get a score the same for I did 22 promotion processes to get to watch commander position and uh, one of the feedbacks was really good Pete but you're a little bit like a grenade you're either going to do something really exciting or you're going to blow up in my hand and I'm not sure I want that I would much rather prefer somebody that's just going to do what I tell them to do and that really hurt when I was told that yeah I'm probably the same mm. <laughs> um, but support the energy to to let it blossom and grow rather than be afraid of what it is that it could I would say it's like a box of fireworks. Yeah, you're right. If we put them on the floor in this office and set them off, they're going to burn the house down. But actually, if you put them outside and direct them in a certain direction, it's going to be something pretty wonderful, potentially. Absolutely. He's got to find, find it. So after that initial sort of exposure to the wider world, and I think that's great because you've had kind of an eclectic um, I would say people that work for one service their entire career, it's like reading one page of an entire book. But when you start to interact, and I've had this in a different guise to yourself in terms of speaking with individuals from all over the world and different ways the fire service is interpreted and applied globally. And uh, it's tremendous to see the different variations of approaches, even though most people um, in the public probably think we all do the same thing. It's amazing how many different ways we've managed to interpret it. So from those conversations and interactions you began to have uh, globally, how did that open up your sphere and your kind of holistic view of the the landscape of what was happening around thought processes and effective command? Initially, so people reading the paper making inquiries, the XVR software have always been a, a strong supporter of my work. And a number of their customers especially um, in Asia, were um, buying the software without any clue how they're going to use it. Um, they kind of perceived it to be a bit like a microwave oven that you put an instant commander in it, and, yeah. and out of it comes a fully qualified Ding. commander without <laughs> any influence from anybody else. And I could provide that sector competent critique, development journey, assessment criteria, yada, 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 piece. So they started asking that I would you speak to these people and um through that uh sort of exposure and interaction i became aware that there was potentially a life me on the other side of, of the fence um i was also at a tricky point of my career where um old pension scheme back to migrate to the new about yeah, to look you know doing uh, committing to a lot longer time or, or it, it, it was a crossroads for me and the um external interest in my skill set um for most i was going to say is there also an element of knowing your worth as well because people say i mean the fire service runs on passion you know people say we don't do it for the uh, income we do it for the outcome theoretically what we're part of and what the fire service or the emergency service is to speak about it wider stands for but you should also know your worth because the things you're consulting on and influencing on were with respect far beyond the pay grade of a watch manager yeah um but like, like you, I didn't necessarily conform very well at um, promotional processes um, because there was a very fixed, rigid assessment criteria and scoring for um, certain things. I, I was um, temporarily promoted to station management department um, and then went had to go through a station manager board. One of the substantive posts was the one I was sat in temporarily and there was only me that could do the role that I was fulfilling but I didn't come in the top three, I think, of, in the board because I 
was already doing the station manager job and had no time to study, whereas those watch managers on shift stations had a lot of time available to study, but I, I didn't have that luxury. So They learned the marking yeah. graph here in the job specification, yeah. and they just regurgitated it. All of that frustration, and um, I, there was talk about them bringing in one of these station, new station managers in to sit in the station manager role and me to be a watch manager beneath them and, and then not have a scooby of what mm-hmm. they're going to do. Um, and lots of these things were influencing my position. That, that never happened. That, that I, I remained in a temporary post and they um, would like to believe that they were working towards a solution to leave me in post, but it, I, it didn't need to materialise because at that point I decided to um, exit stage. How one. did you come to, because the, there's that moment of you know, that pain point, for want of a better description, where you go, you know what, there, I'm going to go for it now, because you've already alluded to partner, growing family, complexity at home everyone has their own version of complexity but that is not i don't want to skim over that because that's a colossal decision um, in itself to lose it, a, to step away from a guaranteed thing that's going to be there forever and and jump into believing in self really i was definitely at a crossroads and being able to pay the mortgage was a, a an a essential component of of that crossroads I um, attended the Interschultz um, conference trade show in 2015. I don't really know. On my list. I've never been. I'd love to go. Um, if you're a, a fire nerd, it's kind of like Disneyland. Um, I know. I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I went I went to attend the show and the XVR guy said, come and just hang out on our stand for a bit and just see. Just come and see what it looks like on, on the other side. So was this not part of your professional capacity? Were you invited to go privately? So I, I went in my own time, not in uniform. This is a little bit controversial, but I went in my own time, not in uniform, representing myself, not my organisation. I do that all the time. And people try and put my service on it. They go, what service are you from? I said, I'm from the Firefighters podcast. And they go, yeah, but you're operational, right? Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't matter. I'm just here as me. And if that's not very important, that's fine. I don't need to be acknowledged for that. I'm just, I'm here as me. And these are my views and my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. So, so I went, I went, went as me, um, but with a wealth of knowledge and academic publications in the sector, mm. such as who I was and actually where I was from, but though I didn't wave the flag saying I was Oxford Fire Service during my conversations. Yeah. Well, I met some really interesting people. Um, and at one point, one of the founders of XVR, guy called Martin Bozeman, said to me, Kath, can you just take this chap, Peter McBride, down to see the igloo? I'm like, yeah, mm. sure. So have you an igloo? Have you seen those simulation igloo? Yeah. yeah, lone tent with projectors inside. Peter is also uh, on my list. I'd love to speak to Peter, by the way. <laughs> oh, Peter McBride? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, easy. I'll make so, a note. I'll make a note of that. Sorry, carry on. That done. So Peter took me down to um, I took Peter down to the igloo, and um, we just started chatting. And within twenty minutes of chatting, he'd invited me to become part of his from knowledge to practice project in Canada. Wow. And I'm like. Oh my god! <laughs> is, is this really oh, happened? you've given me a really frustrating dilemma now. <laughs> this is to, and I'm like, oh, uh, he? he said, yeah, yeah. Um, he said, but um, I can't pay you for your time, but I can cover your expenses. I'm like, oh, okay. Now this is another, now another dilemma. Mm-hmm. What do I do now? Um, but it was a contributing factor in my journey where yeah. somebody I just met believed i had something significant to offer somewhere else um how heavy was the imposter syndrome at that point oh horrific it's a it's a a good perpetual burden so kind of the conversations progressed xdr were great they um said right i think come on let 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 me let let us help you they uh guaranteed me uh an income of um a thousand pound a month to pay the mortgage um they said look the offer's there. We will chuck enough projects at you to, to earn that money. But if you don't need it, don't claim it, was kind of the caveat. Okay. I'm like, okay. Okay. And we discussed it at home. And, um, <laughs> I, I had permission to take a career break rather than leave. I kind of orchestrated that. Safety like a year sabbatical sort of thing. First, yes. Um, and, um, and I left. Most terrifying season of my life. I'm really, really honest. Got invited to go to be part of some fabulous projects. Um, one of the first projects XVR 
threw at me was um, instant command training in South Korea. Uh, that oh. was baptism of fire. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Instant command training through interpreter. Through yes. Medium of mime. But I learned a lot. Again, communication skills, mm. clarity, figure out what it, what the succinct messages you're trying to convey in as simple English as possible and, and being able to see them evolve, being able to understand the command of an incident without understanding a single word. Yeah. Read so much by body <clears throat> language, mm. and eye contact and um, command presence and respect people show, even though you can't understand a single word they're saying. But another you know, pivotal part of my journey was meeting Peter McBride in, in the igloo. This is mm. it's a nice anecdotal story. Um, and then being invited into the From Knowledge to Practice project that he was running in Canada. Phenomenally honoured to be involved in that um, international best practice club. Phenomenal people that were pulled in. So From Knowledge to Practice was a um, Canadian government funded initiative to bring um CFBT has, in simplest terms, to North America. Um, Peter managed to source funding from all over the place and some really high profile sponsors to devise a curriculum, build, um, to write open source uh, plans for uh, CFBT boxes, training of instructors, the whole shebang. It was all mm. wrapped together. Um, and he pulled me in to do the situational awareness piece, to teach situational awareness to firefighters as well as officers stood outside or inside, because in North America, they obviously go inside. So th that was the, the piece I was asked to bring to the table. But through that network, I I met the um, the heroes, if you like, from around the world. It, it, um, it, there's just 9-11 ex experts, and Jerry Tracy, I heard of him from, from FDMY, mm -hmm. John Madonna from uh, Australia, Sham Raphael from Queensland, Corral, All of Lambert. which we've had on the podcast, incredible people. Well, just, uh, uh, again, I'm not really sure why I was there, but they were freaking awesome people. <laughs> I've um, sat in a couple of rooms where I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing here? Someone's going to ask me a question yeah. at some point in time. Do they realize who I'm not? <laughs> yeah, they're going to kick me out soon. Um, <laughs> it's, it's okay, I'm still here. But yeah, amazing. Um, and, and it... It helped broad my, broad my network and also gained a bit of confidence, I guess, that I had something to offer. Mm. Um, but so when I, so I first left, I was doing a number of different projects and overseas, mostly overseas stuff at that point in time. Started to develop um, the Active Command Assessment Tool. So based on the, the learnings that we I, I learned from within Oxford, but leaving the introspect firmly within Oxfordshire, Effective Command became a, an evolution of that assessment tool. Mm. And again, during my journey, I, I met um, this firefighter academic from um, South Australia Fire Service, a guy called David Lounder, who um, was predominantly uh, sort of an academic support to the fire service. He's not an operational firefighter at all okay. um, down in South Australia, but his father um, was a high level sports coach, wow. psychology and sports coaching. And that influenced him, and we kind of came together and met at an IFE meeting in London, and it kind of just fitted nicely together, the instant command piece and the decision-making, the communication piece that I was trying to bring, and his knowledge and awareness of the, the decision-making psychology and, and mm. the, the stresses. It's something that I talk about an awful, awful lot, that we need to look outside of the box rather mm. than the conformity, and, and it but before we can do that, we've got to allow people to think away from the policies and procedures. Because mm. having that that breadth of um, heightened awareness and skills and resilience to manage situations that don't have a conform response, the two things will not complement each other. Mm. Um, you give people this whole bunch of new skills, which we're then not allowed to use. Um, mm. It's the operational discretion. Take, take me into that paradigm because it was one of the things I read from one of your articles. Exactly what operational discretion is depends on who you ask because everyone has a slightly different explanation or interpretation of what it is. Talk to me around operational discretion because even for a few fire and rescue services, it may still be a new thing. Hopefully not. So the vision behind operational discretion was to empower people to make decisions when faced with an um, unexpected situation. 
Mm. That, that we should not be crippled by indecision or being rigidly tied to policy and procedure, but enabled to step outside the box. Um, from the UK perspective, it's come from a number of high level case studies, which have gone from a, a sequence of events and the Walpole Lake being the, I think, the pinnacle one mm. where people did not act when yeah. they should have been. A lot um, of the incidents have operated around water, isn't it? Whereas people water. believe the decision that they might make may lay outside of the organisational risk philosophy. Yeah, and it's operational discretion is so tied to organisational risk appetite mm. as well. Um, so the, the policy or the guidance has been written to hopefully empower decision making. But through working with lots of fighters in the UK, I can tell you it's the most misunderstood policy nationally. Two questions. Could your firefighters define for me operational discretion? And I get lots of nodding heads. If I ask them, do they understand it? I then get less so. And the reason they don't understand it, there's multiple reasons in fairness, that often operational discretion has been trained or assessed in its assimilation within the individual through e-learning, where we've given them a video to watch and then assess their knowledge through a bunch of multiple guess questions at the end where there is a correct answer to be able to move forward, rather than there being a whole bunch of it depends palette of grey mm. that is acceptable. It's got a fixed, correct outcome through, through this e-learning mechanism. Surely that in itself would imply that that's not operational discretion, though, because if you are giving um, somebody a fixed yes, answer... <laughs> Yeah, and the hypocrisy that, within that, surely. <laughs> and the problem with office discretion is that if you are you know, a practical based person like myself, the statement that it's an unforeseeable event, operational discretion must be an unforeseeable event, yeah. that possibly is a feedback loop with no exit. Mm. If we spend long enough thinking about everything, everything's always foreseeable, therefore it's by default not operational discretion. So the phrase or the terminology I uh, constantly promoting to the National Professional Learning Group is um, rationalised professional judgment. Like that. If we called operational discretion rationalised professional judgment, everybody would understand what it is. Rationalised professional judgment based on your own experiences, dynamic yeah. risk assessment, given the multitude yeah. of complex, ever-changing situational yeah. factors. Yeah. That's based on the unique set of circumstances at that precise moment in time that reflects the crew you've got in the back, yes. their skill level, the competence, their strength, their energy, their fatigue, the kit mm -hmm. you've got on the truck, the fact you've left the dry suits in the plants because they're dry, they're wet from the love on you, whatever. Yeah. All of that making the best of what I can do based on all these situations. Um and that's what how I'm does that differ from some of the work you've done globally? Sorry to interrupt, because some people see what happens in an America as an example and consider some of their practices very different to ours. And some people uh, criticize, some people ridicule. Um, but sometimes I allow myself to believe that perhaps they are more, uh, they empower their teams more, and they're more acquaintly familiar with that aspect of operational discretion, perhaps, but I'm reaching there. Please help me find some solid ground in what I've just said. Context is everything. Okay. But, yeah, but and in the, in the small windows of social media, doesn't allow us um, context. So the whole building construction is a really great place to start with that conversation. Mm. We build buildings out of brick, and we heat our houses with water fed through pipes into radiators, predominantly, or underfloor electrical heating. Mm. In North America, they make houses out of wood, yes, which have got sandwich panels, they sit panels predominantly. All the heating comes from a furnace in the basement, which is then pumped around the building through great big air ducts and comes through the floor. Those boxes, especially in North America and Canada, are incredibly well insulated. They could not put fires out like we do because the box in which the fire is contained is super different to mm -hmm. the boxes we've got at home. So I think sometimes we make judgments of you know, why the hell are they on the roof? Why are they cutting a hole in the roof with a chainsaw? Mm. Um, they've often got no bloody choice other than to have to get some of that heat out. Yeah. Um, they talk about balloon flames and cock lofts, which are fabulous words, 
but in a balloon frames are cavity walls with foam in so the fire goes up between the, the two plywood panels cock lofts are what they call um connected uh, roof spaces on a whole row of houses so their actions are different because mm. of their building construction but in order for us to interact with the conversation and to try and understand the logic in the scenario we make several assumptions just to try and get ourselves in the same framework but yeah. even the assumptions we've made to get us to that point yeah. have led us into our own bias where our own logic isn't going to correlate to theirs yeah there's some things they do that are really really strange um, yeah okay but say um, equally so do we we, then, we can't so justify so the reasons behind half the things we do sometimes we just go because that's what it says the, in the procedure the, the, the pressure they put on their um, platoon chiefs or district chiefs that respond in the, in the command cars is phenomenal because mm. they have one man, one person doing accountability, as they call it, for entry control. Um, they manage all of the command support function, all of the administrative forms, all the recording of who's where, while still going to talk to people in through the window. It, it's phenomenal. So then I think that's crazy, and I, and I keep having this conversation with them that it's um, they need more support to kind of come undone. Gotcha. Um, but the, then we're sending com- commanders into the building. Um, yeah, it, it's we sort of do it. We have uh, BA team leaders who go in and offer a high level of knowledge of, of building construction and understanding of techniques and, and feed that back. So there is there is distinct similarities, but the the um, some of the actions though of North American firefighters, especially in, in America. Um, are also linked to organisational culture and mm. the um, societal value that they place on firefighters. You are a, a hero from mm. the, the moment you put that uniform on, and if you are, if you die at any point whilst being employed as a firefighter, you your name goes on a plaque at, at the fire station. You know, at, Most you, heroes are dead, unfortunately. Yeah. And yeah, I think there's positives to that because culturally, and some of this off the back of 9-11, of course, they are much more patriotic and they're much prouder of their first responder community, I think, than we are over here. And that's part of the reason for the podcast, really, because I think that's quite sad because I think we still add the same level of value, but are not held in the same regard sometimes. Yeah. Talk to me about operational accountability, because it's something I've heard you speak about before, because we do live in an age of litigation and we see some of the tragic ends and questionings. We can take our minds to the Grenfell. I'm sure it all looms in our minds, seeing those people being questioned on the stand. And we try and well, we need to be comfortable with the ability of our personnel and assure that they can be qualified and confident to make these decisions. But how do we actually train people to attain that level of confidence? Okay, so when I was in Oxford, um, we had the other similar Stour incident, which Mm -hmm. obviously was very close by to us. Um, And as listeners will undoubtedly remember, the commanders were um, held accountable for their decisions. It it went to a, a court case. Um, it looked like the incident commander was going to be charged with manslaughter for the death of the, the four firefighters. From an uh, incident command perspective, being a key member in the department at the time, um, the resonance from that was phenomenal. Mm. Because had they been prosecuted, had the individual been charged with the death of those four individuals, it suddenly puts transfers that accountability really firmly onto the, the shoulders of, of the officer. Uh-huh. And then as a consequence, the quality of, of training needed to be more robust, I would argue. There will be a knee jerk and an over index on how things are delivered. But from an organizational perspective, the accountability sits purely in uh, have I got competent, qualified people? Mm. Um so the priority immediately following that incident and led by what was um, C. Farrell at the time, was about command assessment. Assessing For people that are unfamiliar, sorry, so that's the Chief Fire Officers Association. Yeah. Um, yep. that To um, document that, that people were competent to be mm. able to make decisions, so that if a similar situation occurred and the Chief Fire Officer found himself on the stand, that they could say, yes, all my people are qualified. Um, mm. And that was the knee-jerk response 
to that incident and others that followed um, to provide that organisational accountability that they've got competent, qualified people making risk-based decisions that could affect the, the lives of others. Um, How robust was that thread as you tried to connect the dots backwards through the uh, through the organisation and as you look at other organisations now? It, it was quite a ripple of panic initially to, to, to assess these people, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, lots of the UK fire services started assessing if they were not already. Um, some didn't and some really haven't picked up that ball even still, at least not at wow. all command levels. Um, it's routinely done at level one, level two, mm -hmm. but things get murkier the higher you go up through the organisation, um, where possibly lack of clarity or definition of role or guidance coming from the National Fire Chiefs Council mm -hmm. um, you know, provides real clear, clear cut definition of to what it is that people should or should not be doing or how they should be qualified mm -hmm. in order to be deemed a commander. Um, but all that that maybe um, gives us a segue, sorry, into the aspects of direct entry again as well, because for people that are unfamiliar, and um, because I'll be totally honest with you, we do have a number of um, leaders, for want of a better description, that listen at different levels of organisation, even the theoretical tippy top of those organisations, but the vast majority are firefighters and what we would say level one commanders. So could you give us a whistle-stop tour of what you believe from your experiences to be the differentiating factors between the different levels of command and what different people should be doing and maybe overlay that aspect of people coming in at level two so station manager and above direct entry okay so historically in the uk we have four levels of command okay bottom level being level one commanders now the easiest explanation for these is they're commanders who ride the fire truck mm -hmm. they respond on the fire truck to the scene they are operational commanders and in the UK, we have um, dedicated incident command qualifications that it's advocated that all level one commanders should complete to be qualified. And then they document their competence with a, an assessment every two years to revalidate or certify that um, competence, coupled with the new guidance to document the amount of training or command hours or hours they are in charge of an incident. The, the guidance now states that every fire officer in the UK should maintain a certain level of command hours, but it doesn't specify what that total is. So every fire service in the UK has picked a different number. Mm. Um, but and also how that. you um, define a command hour is probably a very flexible description as yeah, well. So the, there's guidance. Guidance, um, so at a job, with the jacket on your back, yep. the command hour, um, could be some kind of dedicated training where you've, um, you're have you purely doing command or you're reflecting on the command role, but in a structured fashion. So could it be um, a tabletop tactical decision-making exercise? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that so can be very diluted, yeah. though. Doing command, um, it's a bit like your driving hours. It's driving. You know, some of that driving is driving to the shop to go and get some milk. Some of that is driving at, at high speed and the blue lights. It's mm. it's better than nothing, which yeah. is kind of where the analogy is. So your level one commanders, they do the level three award as a J convocation. They're assessed every two years. They maintain the command hours total, um, which will include the training and So that's level one commanders. They're on the trucks, operational commanders against um, the UK role map, which is watch manager seven. The next level up is station managers, level two commanders. Now they step onto the very bottom of the next role map up, which is um, EFSM2. Mm -hmm. And again, that's how I draw the parallel when I speak into overseas organisations, that, that that's the level that respond in a car to provide a higher level of management to a scene that's responded to by lots of fire trucks. So in the, in the UK, again, we've got qualifications, SFJ level four award qualification in instant, media, instant command. They've also got maintained their command hours and to be revalidated every two years. So level two officers, bottom end of the FSM2, the next level up is level three officers. So they are still in the same role map, but they're dealing with bigger incidents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so still boots on the ground. Again, there's um, a qualification for that level of command. There's revalidations of command hours, 
And then the highest level officer, the level four officers, they're really complicated because they have one foot in tactical on on scene and one foot pure, purely in strategic in, in the strategic command group. Yes. Looking at the more social and economical effects yes. of some of the larger incidents. Very so, rarely will they go to scene, though. Obviously, at Grenfell, there's a multitude yes, of level four commanders. Yes, this is really but... complicated. So hmm. the advice I give to any of my customers is that if your officers could go to scene, you issue them with fire kit, you mm -hmm. give them a car with blue lights on, and they maintain their blue light competence, they should also maintain their tactical competence to go to scene. Mm -hmm. Because that would negate the um, situation for Danny Cotton when she was on the stand trying to justify why she was at scene. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the perpetual discussion about the most senior fire officer on scene is by default accountable for decisions that are being made. And if you're not qualified or in ticket to make a judgment on those decisions, then you're in an uncomfortable space. I think that's been one of the... Um, common themes of concern when I speak to different firefighters and level one incident commanders about this aspect of direct entry, because some of those, so and please correct me because I will fumble my way through this. They will come in as level two officers, but will still be close enough to the tip of the sword, close enough to the furnace to potentially implement decisions that may put somebody in harm's way. Now I would layer that with, the fact that there is a very long development process for these individuals and they will go through levels of development and competency and assessment. However, it still does inherently concern some old hands on the deck that uh, that these people will be so close to the fire, for, if you excuse the pun. Do you think level two is the right level for them to be coming in at? It's all super complicated. I appreciate that. And again, there's no one... Um, um, so... You know, in some organisations, they that have got a large cohort of maybe retained or less mm -hmm. experienced level one officers, the role of that level two officer when they respond to the incident is to you know support, mentor, monitor those level one individuals, mm -hmm. um, as well as possibly take command of that incident if it's if it's going wrong or if it's escalating. Mm -hmm. Now, that level two officer at a smaller rural fire service will have to be hands-on because there's mm. not the scope on the um, response rotor for them to do anything other than support the existing dynamic that has been developed through mm. crewing levels or um, ability to, to recruit people to that retained station. So that role is quite distinct. Mm. to a station manager role that maybe is in, in fire safety or some kind of specialist recruitment role that yes. doesn't need to go to the operational incident. And, and it's really quite complicated. So that, that direct entry at level two is a really interesting starting point for a direct entry mm. um, project. It is, yeah. Because again, um, even whether or not they choose to take command, echoing back to the Danny Cotton analogy, they will still be overall responsibility yeah. for any actions or inactions uh, any failure to comply or dangerous activity that might happen on that incident ground yeah absolutely um and the tricky thing is just through the data that's been collected through the effective command tool which i'm sure we'll come back to in a minute it highlights that the least experienced officer in the whole of the uk fire service is the level two officers really? and that is in officers that have come through traditional mm. channels um, so it's so that's where my dialogue is being the direct entry team is that I've got a, a huge subset of data which has been collated through traditional promotional routes of level two officers that should, I feel, be used to influence shaping the development pathways for these individuals that are coming in from non-traditional routes. That's fascinating. That makes sense. Mm, absolutely. Take me into the world of, of effective command. Um, if we cycle back to the sure. origins of coming coming back from uh, FDIC and some of these big aspects and realizing that you had a tremendous amount of value to add in that sector and coming perhaps close to the end of your sabbatical or whatever it was from your service and deciding, am I now going to go for this? Okay. So invited lots of international projects, 
Um, had a number of streams running in the UK as well, but the first thing we developed was Effective Command in conjunction with David Lounder from South Australia. So we took the the premise of the, the NOS national, national operational standards for each of the four command levels mm-hmm. um, and embedded on that a whole bunch of decision-making behaviours that people should be doing naturally to manage a scene under to meet those parameters. So, um, but the thing that I am super passionate about is not tick boxing. Mm. So, effective command is a marking sheet, if you like, very very crude definition of it. It's an electronic marking sheet with um, eight pages of assessment that goes straight from situational awareness through decision making, planning, communication, command, and review. It goes right through the whole of the, the incident. Um, management cycle and on each of the assessment pages a whole bunch of criteria and individuals are assessed against those criteria and data is generated which documents competence and achievement if you like and that same template is used for training officers monitoring them um, doing formal assessments, promotion assessments. It's the same criteria regardless of the incident type they're facing. Um, and the tool is widely used um, around the UK now to, to generate data. Mm. 50 so fire and rescue important. services, I think it's said, but also other yeah. sectors as well. Um, yeah. you, you are now it's, facilitating it's really for. growing, growing arms and legs. The, but the premise behind the head of command tool is that you are um, managing an incident, let's say it's an assessment, you've come to the assessment centre, we're going to give you a scenario, I want you to manage that scenario, I want you to just manage it as you as you would. There's no yeah. correct answers, there's no tick boxes, there's no magical secret buzzword bingo rubbish that we're expecting you to deliver on. I really want you just to, to manage the scene. Um, we're going to naturally react to everything you do. You give me a crappy brief. I'm going to perform crappy actions. If you yeah. if you're really bullish to me when I come in as the police officer, I'm probably not going to be very helpful. Yeah. You know, it's going to feed off your energy and how you manage the scene. The assessor is going to take notes based on your performance and then sit down with you afterwards and then get inside your head um, and ask you questions like, what did you do? What did you do that for? What, why did you have four trucks coming? What were you going to do with them? And where do you think that fire was going to go? Mm. Why did you ask them to do that first? Mm. Why get inside your head to really understand the why behind everything you've done? You know what? This is going to require a colossal amount of personal development from those people sitting and asking those questions because yeah. they will have also accidentally been indoctrinated into a it's tick a sheet journey. approach. Yeah. It's a journey. You take the effective command pill as an organization. I, I need a cultural shift. Um, yeah, <laughs> the emotional because, intelligence is going to have to raise quite dramatically to shift. Um, but that generates so that generates that discussion, and though the app that discussion is all documented on the assessment tool. Um, and instead of asking questions like, Did you do a 360? instead, I'm going to give you a score out of five of how well you did your 360 and how well you shared the information you gathered from your 360, because that's much more valuable than just. Yep, he ran around the building because um, it's, it's not the same thing. Um, and the important piece for the effective command is that the tool is used for training individuals, so training the behaviours that you want to see, that mm. you are perpetually assessed in those behaviours, and it's also used out for monitoring instant performance too. Mm. I love how you describe it more as the thinking commander, which yeah, I really love. That, that is the nub of it. Um, yeah. And it's super important that the philosophy is embraced by the whole organization. Mm. Because it has a golden thread running all the way through the organization. And if you have, you start trying to be able to think what joining is a command development and through the post assessments. And then when you get out to an incident, somebody turns up with a clipboard and starts giving you, marking you down for not having the right tabards on, or you haven't got the coverage out, or, you know, they're, they're, they're making those tip box observations about your actions as opposed to asking you why is there not covering jet out yeah I'll tell you i've only got one tank of water and i've got two firefighting jets we'll have a covering jet when the next pump comes in mm-hmm. awesome 
that's freaking amazing. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what that's what I want. That that level of intelligence. Because historically, we just used to do a thing without a full comprehension of why we were doing it. It was that um, unconscious competence, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's what I started to create when I um, was in the UK, this effective command ethos, and it's grown a lot. So we kind of launched it in 2015, 16. It's had a number of iterations and updates, and, and now we've got seven years of the data within the database. So the data I analyze is only taken from formal assessments um, and all of the assessors within the country that use the tool mm-hmm. have to be annually standardized by me where I come in and I I sell the, the thinking commander philosophy and try to get them all thinking uh, appropriately or in a consistent fashion. And we mm-hmm. run standardization exercises where we get everybody to corralled into recognizing what good looks like in a consistent mm-hmm. fashion. Um, often there's organizational differences. So what good looks like for your organization might not be what good looks like for Northumberland or Manchester or Cumbria. Mm. It's a sliding scale and that's okay because the expectations of what good enough and safe look like for Northumberland mm. could, should be different than somebody mm. who's got five trucks there within five minutes. The, the, the behaviors are so different that you need to be able to demonstrate. So I, get them to accept what three out of five is, what safe and satisfactory looks like to their organization. And then Mm -hmm. I can then put all the data in one big bucket and then analyze it because it's all been standardized. That makes any sense. Yeah, no, because if people are just trained to pass an assessment, they can be, that's that blissful ignorance as to they don't fully understand why they're doing the thing that they're doing. But that, that competence, and I think you have it in one of your presentations, is that knowing what you're doing, yes, knowing how you're doing it, sort of, but more importantly, that that often missing overlaying circle of knowing why you're doing it mm-hmm. um, leads to that individual becoming competent and then developing that unconscious competence where they develop those good habits, which can inevitably lapse uh, over time, perhaps. Yeah. Through an experience. And like I so say, we have a, a significant less exposure to incidents these days. Absolutely. And you're aspiring to have a metacognitive workforce. Mm. The cognitive has a conscious awareness of the things that are doing that are right. So they're intuitive decisions. They can rationalize why they're doing them. And, mm-hmm. and that's really what you're looking for. Um, mm. and, and we've got a lot of data now that um, I've analyzed recently. With, um, I'm presenting to the National Facial Learning Group next month um, about the trends within, within that data set. But the weakest spot is the level two commanders. Um, we've got a graph that, that makes a lovely um, new shape. The station manager role, I would argue, is the most difficult in the organisation. Mm. It's the biggest step up. Um, you have a long time to practice being a level one commander through typical channels. And when you step up, you've always got to look, you keep an eye on what's going on at the incident as well as looking looking out wider picture as well at the same time i think one of the big things that gets missed there as well is you lose the biggest level of cultural support that you've always had because you step away from that watch culture yep. so your your ability to cross-reference have a sounding board you know gain different input from from a wider group of experiences falls away from you because you're operating by yourself in an office in a one-person car and you lose a lot of that it's a lonely place. Mm, how about? Um, and that's the the, you know, the the conversation I've been having with the direct entry team is, team is about appropriately supporting these individuals mm, to, God. Yeah. to manage within that dynamic and whilst really thoroughly embracing the diversity that, that of the skills that are coming in um, and empowering those individuals to um, to be quite to quote hot fuzz the, the greater good. Um, I think it's really Great important. Great, good. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I, th- I think that's it's it's going to be a very interesting project. I'm not directly involved in it at, at the moment. Whether that transpires or not, I, I have a good relationship with a number of the of the teams that are working within it and being invited to be involved in, in conversations about the development of that. It's an incredibly exciting sector at the minute because I see this from the evolution. We're we're due to have um, Sabrina. Uh, Cohen Hatton on in about five or six weeks time I'll, I'll sit down with her and obviously she was involved 
in some of or a lot of um, some of the models that we'll be more familiar with over the past 10 years. Um, but when I look at the applications of effective command now, it's not as though we're stepping away from models from the past. But when I look at like the SPA decision-making model and different aspects like that, when I look at the applications of effective command, the obvious ones are the practical training scenarios and simulation-based command uh, training and assessment tools. But I think it adds several other layers about its ability to help people reflect and case studies and post-incident debriefs and embed the decision-making behaviors throughout the organization without that really jarring learning curve. Because I don't think, if anyone's not familiar with effective commanders yet, it's actually very complementary to a lot of things that people will have already seen in the past. But as you articulated earlier, and is kind of is the overarching theme for effective command, it encourages far more that aspect of a thinking commander. Yeah, and the the key difference, I guess, effective command can mould itself around any existing mm. policies, procedures, organisational <clears throat> structures, decision making models. Because all decision making models are fundamentally the same. It's a it's a, it's a loop. Mm. Of, of a sequence that involves the same key elements, often with a slightly different coloured schematic. I mean, they're all effectively the same thing, but um, I can drop effective command into other countries very easily, and it's the philosophy around the training ethos, and, and I can map it to other professional standards. We've got projects running in um, in Canada and Singapore, and Norway and Sweden at the moment regarding effective command, and I literally the language fits um it doesn't i don't need to change much at all and i can no. then going to generate a, a, another data set that will complement the uk data but from a different different domain um we've also had conversations with police and ambulance services as to whether the philosophy would work and work yeah it would actually i think the assessment criteria don't actually need to change you know uh, gathering of effective information you know I, I need you to provide credible competent assessors who can determine what is appropriate information to be gathered for this incident mm. but i'm not going to give you a tick box list of yes they must x y and z it's much more empowering the right people to make the right decisions and judgments that develop individuals and generate data how do you sort of stop yourself becoming overwhelmed at the moment if we just zoom in for a second for you as an individual because this has been a colossal um, growth curve in people there's one thing about appreciating and recognizing the usefulness and multiple applications that effective command can have in lots of other organizations you know we call this the firefighters podcast but we do speak with paramedics police officers special forces operators and stuff like that this can be a tool in many many sectors but inherently that comes with it an aspect of you and and all the, the teams that you have working with you to become tremendously overwhelmed and become the busy fools how do you stop this from getting out of control, becoming diluted? Similar to uh, you know the aspects of an incident, we can very easily become overwhelmed. So take me for a second to you... ultimately. Um, so we as a I've got two arms to my business. Effective command is one of them, and I've got KM Associates, which is my training company. And that's where the mm -hmm. Skills to Justice Centre sits, and we deliver all the SFJ courses. I as things have grown, and those two things complement each other. Um, I've had to trust people <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yes, how very scary that is. <laughs> and uh, delegate stuff out. So I'm, I'm really lucky. We've got a team of about 30 trainers that deliver the courses. And um, I've built this command structure. We've got um, teams and team leaders and managers to help manage that dynamic. Um, it's something that um, I have been slowly um, building over the last 18 months. Um, effective command has really picked up since since the command as recorded pieces has come out, um, the 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 training pool for videos that, that accompany the the toolkit are phenomenally useful and, and people use them all over the place. So the Fed command tool is usage has picked up and and it's been complemented by the training courses and and I have had to as a consequence take a step back from the um, course delivery. I, I was doing an awful lot of course delivery um, three four mm. years ago and now I I do very little. Um, I, I have to take a more strategic role within the company. It's been quite painful, if I'm honest. But, um, I, I bet it, it has. I have you to... have obviously navigated it well, though, because you seem to have been able to carve out time in your diary to speak to the knuckle-dragging firefighters like me. It's a <laughs> learning curve. 
Um, but yeah, I've got a, I've got a big team, um, which is great. I'm incredibly well supported both in the office and and by our delivery team, which um, has freed up time for me to move into other projects, which is great. And I've got um, a really good friend of mine um, for Beth and Morgan up in Staffordshire, who's the civil contingents lead for Staffordshire. And she has this mantra. She's another very busy lady, but um, if not me, then who? If yeah. not now, then when? And um, I, I, oh yeah, look there, it's on your arm. <laughs> literally tattooed on my arm. Um, and I'm How like, very sad. Oh of me. god. I would encourage everybody not to get it tattooed on them, but I think it helps. <laughs> uh, uh, um, but it then results in me picking up more work. Um, which is, yeah, this is. It's just fun. It's all fun, and um, I always think it's it's nice to frame some things rather as I get to rather than I've got to. You know, these these things are an incredible. Um, I want to say privilege, but also well deserved in in your respect. Um, but it still can be incredibly overwhelming and can force you not to pause and reflect and go, "Wow, I'm very proud of how far we've come and how we're adding such tangible value to something like." first responder community that genuinely without being too romantic are out there making an incredible difference every single day. And you're giving us the tools to be able to do that in a more structured manner, which I'm eternally grateful for. No, and it is a, a tremendous privilege. And um, I am very, very humbled by the process and the journey and, and the privilege that, that, that being invited in to, to help maybe shape organizational growth and um, empower quality training of individuals to hopefully better equip them for life. Really. I think it's never been as needed as it is now. And I think we're very lucky and would be quite lost. Uh, I'm sure if it wasn't you, someone else would be yeah. trying to fumble their way through. But luckily, that's not the case. So, Catherine, I'm very grateful. For you. And I'm very grateful for the two hours you've spent with a knuckle dragon firefighter like me guiding me like the infantile child through some of the complex conversations and i thank you for forgiving me for what i've probably got wrong several times during our oh, conversation it's, it's been great fun thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you I'd be remiss if I didn't, for people that are still unfamiliar, obviously we'll put links to Effective Command in the notes. Um, but if people do wish to uh, become more familiar with the materials or interact with one of your, your member of your team or perhaps even yourself, what would where would you direct people? Yeah. What would be the best place? Contact details are all on the Effective Command website, so that's probably the best place okay. to go. Beautiful. We will link Effective Command in the notes below. People can see that on all platforms. Awesome. Catherine, thank you You're so welcome. much for your time. And I'll teach you soon. Take care. Firefighters Podcast is put together to develop, inspire, and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter Pete Wakefield. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue, please head over to our Patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast. Please hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to. Please support your emergency services responders, and thank you for listening.